Hello learners, I am Karima Avasthi and today we are going to talk about a topic from course 503, English and Grammar. As you must know, any language is really useless without its grammar because we cannot make sense of any language without its grammar. Like that, English is also very essential to its grammar. Now let's talk about grammar in terms of first and second language. You may have noticed or seen in your environment or in your classroom that grammar is never a problem when it comes to your first language or your mother tongue. Generally, incorrect speech is associated with the acquisition of other languages which are not your home languages or are very foreign to you. So if a child comes from a background where the parents say are speaking Hindi at home, there are very few chances that a child will have any problems of incorrect speech in Hindi. In fact, there are no problems found out as such. So when we talk about grammar, it is mostly associated with the second language. Generally, it is English. And if you are from an urban background and maybe an upper class urban background and English is the language which is spoken in your home environment, then there are very less chances that you have a problem in grammar of English also. So in multilingual home where maybe a mother is a Bengali and a father is a Telugu speaking person, then the child's first languages are Bengali and Telugu and he or she will not have any problems, grammatical problems, speech problems in that particular language. So, hence we can conclude that grammar is one, essential to language and second, it is only when we talk about correct grammar, it is generally related to second language because acquisition of your first language is generally at your home environment. So when we talk about language, we talk about three very important points. Language is made up of one, a sound system. A sound system means that how is it that the sounds of a particular language are coming. Throughout my presentation, I am going to use two of our most famous languages which are Hindi and English. So, if I say the sound system of Hindi and English, then A is for apple and A is for anar. These are very similar. The sounds are very similar, yet they are different because apple has an A sound and anar has an A sound. So the sound system for each of the languages are very different. Then comes grammar rules. As you know, the grammar rules for every language are very different and that is what forms a particular language. The third comes language formation. How is it that the language is formed? We are going to talk about these three components today in our topic. Now, first let us discuss our first topic which is the structure of sound system. When we talk about the structure of sound system, we are generally talking about the phonetics, the phonology. So a sound system is unique to a language as I have already told you. In every language, there are some finite systems of sound structures. That is, it is generally assumed, it is a misconception that we can create as many sounds in a particular language, but that is not right. There are very limited sound structures which are given in a particular language. So when we talk about these sound structures, we talk about two components. One is vowels and other are consonants. Language, any language has both these components. It has vowels and it has consonants. So typically a language will have 3 vowel sounds to 20 vowel sounds. It ranges from 3 to 20 and consonants vary from either 8 to 10 or from 40 to 50. You all are aware about 
Hindi and English. So when we talk about Hindi and English, English has 20 vowels and 24 consonants. Now this may be a little confusing because when we talk about vowels in English, we know there are five vowels A, E, I, O, U. But these are the alphabetical vowels. Right now we are talking about sounds. So within sounds, there are 20 vowels and 24 consonants. I mean that there are 20 vowel sounds in English and 24 consonant sounds in English. It becomes a total of 44 sounds. That is what I meant when I said that there is a finite system of sound structure in a particular language. Next is Hindi. Hindi has 10 vowel sounds and 33 consonant sounds. This may be surprising because the Hindi alphabetical system is much larger than the English alphabetical system. However, the sounds are less. So the vowels are 10 which is halved than English and consonants are 33 which make it a 43 of total. Now, sounds are not listed in the alphabetical system. That is what I told you when I said that you have learned about the five vowel sounds when you learn about articles probably in your classes and these are not the same as the sounds that we are talking about in a particular language. There are corresponding sounds of Hindi and English and these sounds have significance in a particular language. These sounds are minimum meaningless sounds which can change the meaning of a word. For example, a is a vowel in Hindi. Now if I say vidya, then vidya is a word and if I add the vowel a in front of the word vidya, it becomes a vidya. A vidya changes the meaning of the word in language where vidya means knowledge, a vidya means not knowing anything or the negation of knowledge. Similarly, there are many words in Hindi which if added a, a to them will change their meaning. Now if I see the same thing in English then a very common example is run. If I say run, then it means bhagna. And if I say running, it also means bhagna, but in a different meaning where run doesn't tell you if the act is happening, we are talking about the act, what is it about run? But running means that running is taking place right now. So specifically when we talk about a word from singular to plural in English we add an s. So there is a toffee and there are toffees. So just a toffee is a singular word and when I say it means one toffee and when I say toffees when I'm saying ease I'm adding these sounds and it means that there are more th there is more than one toffee there are five toffees any number so this is what we mean when we say that these sounds are minimum meaningless sounds of a language and they change the meaning of words now in a language there are different rules which govern a particular language so if we talk about hindi then the rule comes that if a word starts with consonant cluster and first consonant is P, then the consonants that can cluster with P are Y, R and V only and none else. That is, if the first consonant is P, then next sounds are Y, R, L, V. So if I say I take an example of one word which is pile, then immediately p is a consonant sound, pa, and then is yell. So pa yell. 
hear ki sound is the sound is coming so we can say that this is the first phonological rule of hindi language that if a word is starting with a consonant cluster if the first consonant is p then the consonants that can be added on that can be added on with p are here r l v only there are no other sounds that can cluster with so you can also try this with other examples on your own and see how this rules fit into the structure of hindi language so when we talk about another rule in hindi we can say that not more than four consonantal sound can precede a vowel in the first initial position and another so this is the same rule and it has a precondition which is that if three consonant sounds are occurring in a cluster then we have to arrange them in a row so if we call consonant sound is c1 c2 and c3 then the first consonant will be s sound and the second consonant sound can only be p t k it's not p t k but t and k and c3 will only be y r l v so now you can according to this rule make other words and see if this fits in or not now we talk about the other structure in a particular language which is important and that is word formation how are words formed in a particular language when we talk about word formation we say that language is not just organized at the level of sounds at the level of sound structures but it is also organized at the level of words so there are fixed rules about how a singular would be converted into plural so i've already taught you about this that in english there is a fixed rule that if there is a singular if there is a cup then an s would be added and it will be cups so s is generally in most of the cases has to be added to make any singular word into a plural word so this is at the level of word how a particular language has rules about how a word is going to be changed now similarly we have a rule in hindi also if we take the example of two sentences which is one sentence is ladke football khel rahe hain theek hai and the second sentence is ladke ne khana khaya right so what are the boys doing in the first sentence ladke football khel rahe hain boys are playing football and second is ladke ne khana khaya which is the boy is eating food now if you see the word ladke remains same however the sense we get in the first sentence which is ladke football khel rahe hain means that there is more than one boy present there are a lot of guys who are playing football whereas in the second sentence ladke ne khana khaya there there is one boy who is eating food so ladke remains ladke and yet we know that in first sentence there we are talking about more than one boy and in the second sentence we are talking about only one boy how is this so this is related to the action word which is there in a particular sentence khel rahe hain the hain tells us that it is more than one boy and ladke ne khana khaya khana khaya khaya tells us that it is one boy so you can see how the sentence the words also change the meaning of a particular sentence and how they are related now 
another rule in English that converts a noun into an adjective. It is that like I told you in singular and plural, similarly if we add a Y in English then the nouns can be converted to adjectives. So rain is a noun, fun is a noun, sun is a noun, fish is a noun. So when we talk about rain, fun, sun and fish and cloud then if we add Y to it then it becomes an adjective. It becomes rainy, it becomes funny, it becomes sunny, fishy, cloudy, etc. So this is a rule of converting a particular noun into an objective. Now, similarly, how do we convert a noun into an adjective in Hindi? That is by the addition of I vowel sound. For example, we have the words sanskar, bazaar, bengan, aprad. If I add I vowel, sanskar, sanskari, bazaar, bazari, bengan, bengani, aprad, apradhi. So the noun is changing into an adjective. Bengan is a particular vegetable and bengani is a color which is violet color. Similarly, aprad is an act, it's a crime and apradhi is a person who commits the act. So, a noun is converted into an adjective by the addition of I vowel sound. Next part, we are going to talk about sentence construction, right? So, what happens in a language we have talked about, we started from the most basic unit which is sound, then we talked about words and now we are going to talk about sentences. Now how is sentence construction takes place in a particular language? So as you all know there are rules when it comes to sound, when it comes to word. Similarly language is highly rule governed at the level of sentences as well. So at the level of words, it is not that tightly organized, but at the level of sentences, language is more tightly organized. So if I say, I should know where the subject will come, where the predicate will come, how does this fit together and make a meaningful sentence. So sentences are more tightly organized, the rules of sentence construction are very tight. Now, when we talk about sentence construction, then we talk about the relationship between the subject and verb. If I take the example of Hindi, we note down that the verb agrees with the subject as per gender, person, number of the subject noun, right? So, if I say that there's a particular word which is an action word, right? Which is a verb, which is khata, right? Khata, eating, khati, eating. But we know that we use khata for somebody who's a male and we use khati for somebody who's a female. So according to gender, the verb agrees with the subject. So I can take two examples here. One sentence is Ram khana khata hai, right? So Ram is a person, he is a male and he is eating. So khata is depicting that particular subject verb. And now Sita khana khati hai. Sita is a girl or she is a woman, she is a female. Wo khana khati hai. So again here also the verb is agreeing with the subject according to the gender. Now, ladke ne khana khaya, right? One boy is eating food. Ladko ne khana khaya. So, here the words are changing from singular to plural and accordingly the sentence construction also changes. So, this was when we talk about in terms of sentence. And next, we are going to talk about our last component, 
which is discourse structure. A particular language has a discourse structure. Discourse means the way we talk, the way we speak with one another. So what is a particular discourse structure? That is how are we speaking with each other in a particular language. Now social communication is rule bound, right? So we know that when we go in a particular party and when we are talking to some of our friends, we can talk in a very informal language. But when we talk to a teacher or somebody who is an authority, then we talk in a very formal manner. So it means that social communication is rule bound and we cannot cross those norms of communicative rules, right? So now these are also while I'm talking about the use of language, there is also this basic rule that if two people are speaking, then I should not intervene in a conversation as a third person, right? I can always wait for my turn and I have to then speak. But it is a basic rule that if two people are speaking together, then I am not supposed to come in between and overlap them. Or for example, uh, this is a very particular problem in the class. Generally, when, a, when we are using lecture methods as a teacher and we ask a particular question to our students, at that time, all of them are going to raise hands. And one of them says something and the other is going to just cut across. So as a teacher, sometimes we say, your turn is yet to come. You are not supposed to talk when somebody else is talking. So this is a basic rule which we as teachers are teaching. Uh, sometimes you ask a question and all children are going to say the answer in front of you. And at that time you say, I want you all to raise your hands and one by one I'll ask your answers. So this is how we also learn it in our day to day school life. And it is a basic rule. It is a social communication rule, any language. Now. The second rule, if we see, is that language is related to understanding in the right dimension. That is, what is our understanding of language is crucially important, right? When are we speaking? Where are we speaking? So this I've already told you about how we speak to a friend is very different from how we speak to a mother to how we speak to our teacher or maybe how we speak to a boss if we are bigger then you must have seen that how do you talk in the house if you want to say that you know uh, I want food then probably you're just going to say that I want food now, on the other hand if you're hungry at work then you have to ask I'm hungry can I please have food it is a sort of a permission that you are asking and it is very formal. So informally, the language is also used. This is uh, once you speak the same language, that is if I take the example of English itself, then if you are speaking English with your friends and if you are speaking English with your teacher, still the tone changes, the content changes and you will just say, Hey, can you just pass me that? You'll use that language with your friend. But if there's an adult, you'll say, Ma'am, can you please pass me that? So it is a different dimension altogether. So it is, language is related to this understanding. What is the right dimension? How are we using our language in, in a particular scenario is very important. Now, at the level of effective understanding, a sentence becomes meaningful when effective words are used in effective sequence. So that is when sentence structure, word structure, sound structure comes in. That if I, what is used as, why is language used? It's basically a mode of communication. So if I am able to make myself understood to the other person, then the, it is at that level that I'm talking about, another 
person is able to understand me effectively. So a sentence becomes meaningful when I use effective words and they are in effective sequence. I'm able to explain myself so that the other person is able to effectively understand what I'm trying to say. So if I say, ma'am, please go, I. The teacher is just going to look at me, what do you mean? I have to correctly use it in a particular sentence, ma'am, can I please go? And that is when the teacher is going to understand that you actually want to go somewhere. So it is important that we use the effective words in a sentence in a particular structure. And that is what discourse is all about. So this was the end of our presentation today. We talked about language, we talked about English and grammar, we also talked about Hindi and grammar. So we are talking about how language is important and how grammar is equally important in a language. It makes the language what it is. And when we talk about language, we understood that we talk about three main points, which is one is the sound structure. We started with the smallest block and then there is words and then there are sentences. And at each level, there are rules which govern them. And according to these three rules is what our sentence structure is, is our language constructed. And if you use these in a particular manner, if you have this understanding, then you can help your students and they can easily become good readers and writers and use the particular language, specifically second languages, effectively. Thank you. Now we are going to see you in the next lecture.